thank you all for joining us as we chat about the making of the stunning and inspirational film, There Is a Place on Earth, with director Helen Van Den Hornet and two of the film's subjects, Harvey Locke and Bryant Austin. This is Alan's first film, having turned her attention from music in the Bay Area too, I understand, Alan. That's to right. <laughs> to documentary film after her curiosity got the best of her when she began to muse about how artists relate to wilderness conservation. I mean, isn't technology amazing when we are able to gather from all over the world to talk about your film? Oh, I absolutely love it. There's there's advantages to this this whole pandemic as well. I think it's, yeah, it's amazing. So, and it's so good to see you know Bryant and and Harvey you know, that I ob obviously haven't seen for a while. So it's good to see you both. And you don't know each other. So Brian, meet Harvey and yeah, way around. Nice to finally meet you, Harvey. Nice to meet you, Brian. I enjoyed <laughs> your, your, the spectacular images of the whales that you put together. Oh, thank you. And I loved your piece too. It, um, it could get lonely doing what we do. And it's nice to see other people out there creating great work such as yours. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. <laughs> You went on quite a journey to some of Earth's wilder places for the making of your film. Maybe you could start just by telling us why and how you came to contact uh, Harvey and Bryant for the film. Oh, that definitely just didn't happen like that. Um, it all started with, with just an idea, like I'm sitting here in an attic room and uh, in the Netherlands, which is not one of the wildest countries on Earth. So, it definitely took a while and um, just the persistence to keep meeting people, to keep asking about this subject. And so really it was one thing that led to another that finally then led me to, you know, amazing artists and, and people that are also working on conservation at the same time, like, like Bryant and, and uh, Harvey and, and also all the other artists in, in the film. But it was no easy road, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> that I understand completely. Now, what was it specifically, let's start with Harvey, for example, what uh, drew you to him? Well, I started reading because, um, you know, just like a musician, like I'm a singer also, and I write songs. And, and when you do that, you also, and I'm, I'm interested in jazz and I sing jazz. And so you have to know who Ella Fitzgerald is and Sarah Vaughan and you, you have to know on whose shoulders you stand. So once I became interested in conservation I started reading a lot just to catch up on, on the subject and all the writers and the people and so eventually just like meeting people I also started seeing more books and I came across Harvey's book which was called Yellowstone and still is called uh, Yellowstone to Yukon the journey of wildlife and art. And it was really the first title that put those two subjects together that I am I was so interested in connecting. So I was like, wow, this is amazing. I was really uh, surprised to find it. And so Harvey, how, what did, how did you react when Alan contacted you and, and said what she was up to? Well, I, I met Ellen a few years ago uh, and her being a singer and a songwriter and interested in the arts, of course, uh, I'm always looking for ways that we can engage a broader community of people in the pursuit of the preservation of the natural world. So Ellen comes in with all this experience and accomplishment in, in another domain of music, of songwriting and, and singing. And she's interested in the stuff that I'm interested in. And my immediate reaction is fantastic. Let's talk because, you know, the, having somebody with a different kind of perception coming into the space of being mm -hmm. concerned about nature and being concerned about conservation and the images that, that provoke and ev evoke passion and concern and love um, is just super for me. So I had all the time in the world for Ellen and she came to see me in Banff a couple of times and we had some good visits and some wonderful conversations over the years on, on things. And it was just a, a really a delightful experience to work with her on this. And then I even, you know, we, even we talked a little more and we even got this idea of bringing the bison stuff into the story, um, which sort of is just evolutionary sort of through conversations. But uh, Ellen was a, a rookie with a lot of experience in producing stuff in another space. So while she, this may be her first project in, in, in a film, 
it's not her first project in realizing complex undertakings in the arts. And so it was fun to work with her. That's for sure. And um, Harvey, uh, just so, you, so everyone knows, Harvey's in Banff, Canada right now. And uh, I am also familiar with his work and can see how this would work so well with, with what you love, given your, your interest in, in um, interacting with so many different communities around the conservation space. And I also know that you're quite a proponent of nature needs half as well as rewilding. And uh, that those two concepts seem to be so important right now in what's going on with wild places. Hmm. Yeah, it's an exciting time in the sense that we launched this idea of protecting half the world in 2009 at the World Wilderness Congress in Mexico, which was also an event that we had a lot of the arts at. So it was kind of fun from that point of view. And the idea of like, let's talk about what we need to do, not saving the last little pieces, but let's talk about what we ought to do, which is protect at least half the world. And, you know, we're in a relationship with nature. We don't, we don't own the world. We act like we do, but we don't. And we don't know how to manage the world. We act like we do, but we don't. That we depend on the earth for everything, for the air we breathe, the water we drink. The, you know, we just don't know how to do that without nature. And so this idea is really caught on now, and there's now a big movement um, internationally, which the U.S. has just joined into to protect 30% of the world by 2030, which is sort of an outgrowth of this idea of protecting half the world, this nature needs half idea. It's not enough to do it by 2030, but it's a heck of a big improvement and a big step <laughs> forward. And we're seeing this bigger agenda for like, we need to save nature for climate reasons, for human health reasons, for ethical reasons, for relation relational reasons. And it's really quite exciting for me to feel this energy out there, even though all the signs are bad on the environment, but there's positive energy towards doing something big enough to matter, which is what this nature needs half ideas about. Exactly. And what's what's that 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 line that's going around? It's like, um, if you if you think nature or conservation aren't important, uh, just try uh, uh, breathing while you count your money. <laughs> that's exactly right. I mean, it really is that simple. We are creatures of the earth. We are not in charge of the earth. So we have this kind of really serious mental disorder going on where we think this earth is here just for us to manage, exploit, do whatever we like to it, and then we'll get rich and it'll all be fine. Actually, that's nuts. It's actually our home. And we live on as species on earth, not the other way around. And just I always like to say to people, if you're thirsty and you don't think the earth matters, please tell me the recipe for water and go make some for us all to drink right now, please. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So Ellen, that probably sat really well with you in terms of, of what you learned about Harvey and, and why you um, really wanted him in the film. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, and uh, we also started talking about language and um, beauty. And I, I remember Harvey um, saying something like, you know, when we talk about nature, we shouldn't talk about, you know, economical things, which which is also something I bring up in the movie, like like ecosystem services and you know, trees are resources. But we have to talk about, you know, the complexity of life and about how, how beautiful it is and feelings and emotions and, and the intuitive connection we have if if, you know, we want to shift next to all the other shifts that are necessary, like, like science and, and education and politics. So yeah, I mean, so yes, it was definitely uh, uh, also something that Brian just said, it's just, it was really amazing to, to, to meet with Harvey for someone who understands complexity. And that's really the kind of people we need in the world now who understand how to bring all these things together. And you know, Harvey is, I may say so, <laughs> one of the best there. He, he really gets that, so. Yeah, and, and a good speaker too. Yeah. And so, um, Bryant, when Ellen came to you, um, how did you react and what? why did you want to take part in the film? Oh, I mean, it, it's, um, it was obvious. I mean, it's like doing the kind of work we do is, is, is um, you're, you really do feel on your own and you're, you're 
sometimes working in a vacuum. So when someone reaches out to you who is basically saying the things that you think every day, this, narr this narrative in your head about, you know, just what's wrong with the world, what's wrong with art and, you know, what you're trying to do to bridge these connections to the natural world. And, um, and uh, so, yeah, when Ellen proposed that, her film project to me, I was like, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> this is a subject that needs a lot more attention because it's reflective of our, our, not only our disconnect from nature, but our disconnect from the understanding that we're inseparable from nature, that you know, we are a, a conscious manifestation of earth. I mean, of, I mean, we're just so disconnected. So this is a, an important step in that. The arts have a lot of power to bridge that. And so that's why I was really excited to be a part of it. Yeah. And so with your work um, from the film, I really gathered that you, you are looking far forward in terms of what your work can do to forward, you know, our, our desire to save whales, for example, sure. but over, overreaching. Yeah, I mean, really, when you think about whales, I mean, they, they live in another world. And so when we talk about whales, it's purely verbal. And, and even the, photo, the photography, all photographs, it's, it's very abstract. And then that invites a lot of space for people to, to mock or say, oh, whales, whatever. You know, but when whales come into our lives, whether they swim up a river in, you know, in London or you know, uh, here, here in the San Francisco Bay Area, you'll have 15, 20,000 people come out who had no idea you know, that they would be moved by whales. <laughs> so there's, a, there's this, just this constant um, exploration and figuring out how do you bridge that? Like obviously 7 billion people can't see whales up close, but so how, how do you bridge that? So my, my photography has just been that, a part of that exploration. Yeah, that's a fantastic way. I mean, your photographs are just amazing, whether oh, it's the you. entire whale or just focusing in on one part, like the eye, amazing stuff. Yeah, that was the starting point. I thought, let's just go super high resolution, highly detailed life-size photographs and just see where we could go from there. Um, yeah, it's just a, it's a starting point because like I said, you can't have 7 billion people be eye to eye with a whale. A lot of my peers that are wealth, I mean, the whale photographers in my community very rarely will have the kind of encounters I have. Um, I work, I work, have a different approach and it's actually really boring, but you, you wait for whales to come up to you and, and they come up to so close, you have to push off of them. Um, and you have these amazing portrait sessions. Um, and yeah, so that, that was the first step. That was the, the spark that, of inspiration that I wanted to see how people would respond. Yeah. Well, that yeah. sounds really boring. <laughs> <laughs> it is. You would be surprised. That was fun. <laughs> in the beginning, I used to have uh, volunteers. I would have a safety diver with me in the water and, and they would get bored and they would say, well, you know, I want to just like leave early or I want to go to another island and go scuba diving. I'm like, I understand because we're just floating. We're, we're floating motionless um, for eight hours a day. And we're observing whales from a distance from like 80 feet, 100 feet. And you just, you're just breathing. You're, it's a meditation, really. And so I actually just work alone now. It's a lot easier because whales, they have scientifically have shown that whales are more likely to come up to you, uh, some species. If you're alone, the more people in the water, the less likely they'll come up to you. So. Exactly, yeah. 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 Well, uh, if you need any help, <laughs> because that sounds, to me, that sounds like yeah. heaven. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it's heaven for a lot of people, but it's surprising. Like, yeah, I think I think it's just because we're we have trouble, you know, finding presence, you know, being present, um, and so we're we're restless. We want to control things, and it's true with a lot of my my colleagues. Like, they, they just want things to happen, right? Because it's so expensive to work with whales, um, and we just want things to happen. So it's really hard to be present and to let go, to surrender. We're always wanting to control. And that's an illusion. And, and usually the results are very homogenous when you try to control. So it's very subtle to surrender and do nothing. And it's also, it can be very stressful. You're like, what am I doing? Is this, <laughs> is this a good idea to just sit here <laughs> and, and really like, you know, burn through a lot of money. And, uh, but it, it's, yeah, it, when you see the results, um, that's all you want to do. I mean, cause you know, um, you know, when you create that invitation for a well, to explore their own natural curiosity of you, of you um, that it, it's mind blowing when, when, when 
everything comes together. Now, Ellen, how did you learn about Bryant and his work? Well, <clears throat> once I got on my way, I actually um, went to Hawaii, which, which was not boring, <laughs> to, um, to, to work as a volunteer, uh, which you see shortly in the film also, for the Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National uh, Marine Sanctuary. They, they are there to, to protect whales and the waters that the whales swim in. And, um, and that, that's where I met Ed Lyman, and uh, Brian knows also Ed Lyman. He's the, the head of the, the, the rescue um, or the disentanglement program, as they call it. And so um, it's, it's really amazing because he was a, he, so Ed is a conservationist, but he, he, when he heard what I was doing, he said, well, have you heard about Brian Austin? Mm -hmm. And I hadn't heard about Brian Austin. So I immediately looked him up and eventually found his amazing book, a Beautiful Whale. In a in a bookstore, some I believe it was in Amsterdam somewhere. Oh wow! And so maybe even a secondhand copy, but I found it and and I started going through, again through a book and and um, I, I found the courage to give him a call. <laughs> so yeah, That's yeah. You were actually supposed to go to, to Hawaii, uh, Brian, at some point, right? To 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 work with them, but it never worked out. That that would still be a great plan. Yeah, that was the vision. Is to to uh, back then. Um, the challenge is always how do you do it safely and and in a way that doesn't cause distress to the whale, but to make a life size uh, portrait of an entangled whale, like its whole body, if possible. Um, yeah, because it's it's this. You know, Ed struggles with it, but like it, it's like the the we just have to move away from, you know, catching fish at sea with, with fishing gear. You know, there, there has to be other ways to, you know, to do that. Um, but yeah, so that, that's, yeah. How, how I would, the idea was like, how do you connect people to like what's on their plate, what their, their lifestyle choices are in terms of eating commercially caught seafood uh, or wildlife I think of now. Um, bridge that to like the reality, like here's the reality of, of your lifestyle choices. And so uh, maybe, maybe someday, sometime right. in this decade. So I'm, I'm working on phase two. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. Well, the other thing that I was just thinking of now is, is there a movement to rewild the ocean too? Maybe those aspects could be more aligned. Yeah. Well, maybe I could uh, jump in with one thought on that is that the, um, the idea of protecting half the world is land and sea. It's not, it's not one or the other. And one of the really interesting things we know in, in ocean conservation is if you remove the fishing pressure, in many places, the rebound of the marine life is spectacular. And I want to support what Brian said earlier about it isn't seafood that swims around in the ocean. It's wildlife that swims around in the ocean. And, and we have what we do is we are overhunting the ocean. That's what overfishing is. It's overhunting. That's all it is. And, and we're, we're doing way too much of it. And we're destroying fisheries all over the world. We need to pull back and then the, the oceans will bounce back. Um, but one of our challenges is a lot of the most productive areas in the ocean are near shore environments. So what we do on land also impacts the ocean. So, you know, this idea of dead zones and estuaries, which are normally the really hyper productive areas, but uh, chemicals from farms on, on, on land go down rivers, freshwater rivers into estuaries. And we've got to start thinking of the world as one big hole, not land and sea, not land, freshwater and sea, but it's all the same thing. And the whale is a mammal like us, right? It just happens to have adapted to living in the water. And, and this is how, you know, it is literally our family. And we need to see the world differently. And this is one of the cool things. Indigenous people see the world that way. Other cultures actually see the world that way. And our Western culture is a bit anomalous in seeing everything as an object to exploit, not a relationship. And you know, when I heard Bryant speaking, I couldn't help but, but think, you know, if you let nature happen, it's always richer than if you chase nature. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, for, for me as uh, someone who takes photographs, it's that, that moment when nature presents itself to you and you've thought about what you'd like to get in the image ahead of time. And it's not the same as contriving the image and forcing the image to occur. It's sort of imagining it ahead of time. And then when nature presents itself at that moment, that's when you have the magic interaction between your camera 
and the subject. It's sort of this dance, it's this, it's this exchange. And, and traditional hunters will tell you that, um, like uh, I read interesting thoughts about this in, in the North where traditional people will tell you when an animal presents itself to be shot for you to eat. It's a relationship. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not a, you know, the stock and the, the it's, it's a different thing that goes on. And I know that my favorite wildlife photographs or my favorite light moments with photography come when there's this convergence of imagined image and then the presented moment by nature rather than forcing it to happen by sitting there with my tripod for four hours waiting for the light. It's sort of, a, it's kind of a different kind of a magic. I don't know if you agree with that, Brian, but that yeah. sort of works for me. <laughs> Yeah, that's that sounds about right. I mean, it, it's it's like it'll it'll humble it'll humble us. It's like it nature will remind you how small our imaginations are. It'll remind me of just yeah how yeah insignificant my imagination is, and and I, I do I can't, I kind of go out with these ideas and these things I want to compose, and then something else happens, and I'm just like oh, <laughs> you know. So it's it's yeah nature really inspires that way, and um, I mean it's infinite. The elements of nature uh, as a subject, you know, for creativity, the, the elements are infinite. The relationships are infinite. And when you think about traditional, you know, art forms coming from the human experience, I mean, it's it's way more limited than if you add nature to that. You know, um, yeah, yeah, I love it. <laughs> it just is that it's that incredible disconnect that we have. It's like. I, and I, I just don't understand how we just want to commercialize everything and make it disappear. Well, there's nothing left afterwards. I just don't understand why we're not smart enough to, to, to get it. You know, it's, it's all about the mental story we walk around with in our heads. And one of the reasons I was really pleased to work with Ellen on this film is Ellen was trying to just say, let's think about nature as a worthy subject of art. Yeah. You know that there's a bias against that? Mm. that? That nature is not a worthy subject of art. It has to be a human subject to be good art. And Ellen and I talked a lot about this and she got into the vaults of this amazing art collection mm -hmm. in the Eastern Netherlands of the Rijksmuseum Twente which has this incredible collection of the, some of the best wildlife art in the world that is buried in the basement because it's not quote art because it's not human subject matter that it's, it's somehow illustration or something lesser if it's about nature. And that's part of that bias that we have that if it isn't about humans or human centered, it isn't valuable. And it's, it's completely crazy because if you, you know, I was reading some, some history the other day about, uh, artist magist, uh, uh, nature magistra artist, which means nature is the teacher of all arts. Yeah. And, and that is the foundation of physics and everything else. It's just that we've gotten ourselves so into our heads that we think that it's just this kind of like a, a giant store for us to exploit as we see fit, instead of this wondrous place, which is the our home place where we evolved from and what we're dependent on and what we should be living in harmony with. And I'm really excited that enough people are asking the question now that we have a chance of turning the corner on this thing into a different place. And I'm really excited about that chance. And Ellen's film helps to illustrate that just visceral beauty and the love and the passion that you can have for nature, which is just never lets you down, except for when it's cold and blizzarding in your face like it was yesterday when I was on Deception Pass. But next minute it was sunny. It's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, that's really interesting. You think about like human centered art, you know, anthropocentric art, um, all about the human condition is really just a, a reflection of our disconnect from nature. Yeah. And, and that, of course, invites suffering for both humanity and for nature. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's just a, it's just a be almost a beautiful reflection of our disconnect. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's almost like, yeah, the, the unconscious self wants to see unconscious works so like they want to see work that's the unconscious self wants to see work that's disconnected from, from yeah. nature from our larger truth ellen you must have been just blown away when you did get into that vault and see that <laughs> oh absolutely yeah 
No, it, there was somebody else who was really surprised that I called um, Mr. Paul Knoller from the museum because you know that was after I met Harvey and he told me about it so I was like hey I just um, heard from Harvey that there is art in your museum and your and that museum is in Amsterdam correct no it's actually in the east part of the Netherlands oh. which is but it's and and it's pretty close to where I, where I was living at the time too and and um so there was definitely a silence on the other end of the line like whoa who's interested in this art which you know, illustrates again, like how little people had even asked about it. But now we filmed it and now we're bringing it out. And I'm mm -hmm. really excited about that too. Um, and yeah, you know, it's, I mean, it's just so amazing to, to hear Bryant and, and Harvey talk again um, about all these things. And at, at the same time, I also wanted to make that extra step in the film to, to, to make people realize that art is, or that nature is not only the inspiration uh, for art, but also um, that we as artists now can do something back for nature, which is impact people with art about nature. And so this, this art that we're looking at, uh, this, or let's call it wilderness art or whatever you want to call it, can have impact. And that is something that a lot of people might be surprised by you know because they just think oh it's such a nice painting of a mountain or something but it has a lot of meaning and that's what the film also tries to project yeah and, and it can change it I, I do believe it has the power to change people and their and the decisions that they make uh, just like politics or science like i said before art has that power so um yeah, so thank you for sh uh, showing this film to share that with, with more people. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited about that too. Yeah, it, it was really important to me to be able to include it. But um, that one concept that I had never really put together, the fact that the original artists who went into like, for example, Yellowstone and painted about the, the, the areas there was what prompted national parks yeah. to start. And then that's what really prompted conservation to be real. Like I had never put yeah. those two together. Yeah, that was an amazing discovery for me as well. That was, that was, but it's true. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's fascinating. If you look at that history of those beautiful big canvases that are actually in the Smithsonian Museum, you can see those huge Thomas Moran paintings and they're, they're as big as the wall behind me. Mm -hmm. And you imagine you're sitting in the US Congress before there's any color photography and somebody walks in with this painting that's just luminous of this landscape. And then with him was a photographer who took really great black and white pictures as well. This guy named Jackson say, yeah, this is for real. And then these are the colors. And then the people are, whoa, this is special <laughs> and important. And then what happened is um, about 20 or so years later, wildlife was just collapsing across North America. Like we don't realize how close we came to giant extinctions of things like elk. And we all tend to know about the buffalo or bison almost going extinct, but muskox, elk, pronghorn, it was a disaster. And these wildlife artists painted these things. And, and a, a writer named Ernest Thompson Seton wrote about wild animals having feelings and invented the word wildlife because mm -hmm. before that there was game which was useful and vermin which was not useful and this idea of wildlife is only 120 years old that it has its own wildlife that we should respect and love and Thompson Seton wrote these books which were as widely read as Harry Potter books now mm -hmm. we just don't tend to know that and he wrote these from the perspective of the animal and, and then he was also a good illustrator himself painter Carl Rungus, the master painter, who's uh, in, in the American Museum of Natural History. If you go into the big dioramas in New York downstairs, there's these fantastic dioramas of wildlife. It's all from the same period where you're just getting people into their heads, into these things are fantastically interesting. And these really good artists were making that work and making people resonate emotionally with it, which is why we have those animals today. Like, you know, in Banff Park, where I live, the elk were actually reintroduced from Yellowstone because we have gone killed them all off here. Um, and of course, we, the wolves in Yellowstone were reintroduced from our part of the world 
so there's this exchange that goes on but it, the arts have been fundamental to saving nature for a very long time and mm -hmm. like what ellen did is sort of take it sort of popularize it across multiple scales multiple ways of people making art to say hey this is allowing us to see the world as it is not as we've boxed it in in our heads but right. as it actually is beautiful full of life <laughs> lots of neighbors really cool things <laughs> yeah. yeah harvey i couldn't say it any better way <laughs> um i just wanted to ask too ellen you know and i know this is your first film but in documentary film when you start out you know you have a plan you don't really know exactly what you're going to find where were there any surprises or any um, any anything that came out that you weren't planning, or did, did the film end up the way you had pretty well envisioned it? Well, I listened to Woody Allen, and he—I mean, he does everything, right? Like he, he edits, he produces, and 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 he says every film he produces is only like sixty percent of what he intended. So, I I think I'm probably up there as well, you know, but. Um, Oh, so many surprises, you know, I, I honestly started this, this whole journey so naively and uh, I've had to stop my several times uh, really thinking um, that I would not make it to the end. I, I just couldn't do it. And uh, I met this wonderful uh, editor from the Bay Area, Gina Leibrecht, who I started working with. And um, she really also mentored me through the process and but also um, sent me home once like pretty seriously and it took me about a year to get my act together again to come back to her and um, but I love her for that because she, she really you know she really taught me how to go through the process myself and not uh, do it for me so uh, as hard as it was it was a good learning um, curve so to say but, but uh, oh yeah I mean any any filmmaker you will meet and I can speak to this now will will say that this is this is a very hard thing to do and it's also made on a very low budget and so uh, I'm very proud of, of the results in that sense and we also were very lucky to get some beautiful footage and also from filmers but and from the artists you know as Brian as as Harvey were all willing to to uh, give their beautiful artwork for this film. Uh, the, the, for, for example, the material of, of Zibilla Zagar's Redford, the, the way of the rain footage. So, so there's a, a lot of footage in this film that artists were actually willing to donate as well, that we didn't have to go out and film ourselves. Plus, we're I, I'm not a wilderness filmer and that's way too costly. So there were wonderful wilderness filmers that graciously gave us material that we were all able together with Gina and lots of other people to, to, to make into this film. So tell me, when, how long did it actually take you from start to finish, like from the time you, you took action, like put the first words down to now? I would say five years, like sitting, probably in the same room it's, and, and till now, yeah. About five years, I would say. Well, I have to say that, <laughs> wow, <laughs> for your first film, it's, it's very well done. And I have to ask too, because you're a musician and I love uh, when a filmmaker thinks about the audio and the visual together right from the start. And I suspect that being a musician, did you have music playing through in your head through the whole process? Yeah, <clears throat> unconsciously for sure. But um, I also started thinking about writing some songs, of course, which I did together with another Bay Area uh, resident, uh, Frank Martin, who's an incredibly talented musician and songwriter, who's been my uh, musical partner for many, many years. And so during this whole filming time, I also met up with him uh, either in real time or just like this uh, to, to write. And so we came up with a couple of songs for the film as well. And that's, that's very cool, of course, to, to be able to, to join all those things together. So, so the, the song Kohola Lele uh, was, we wrote and Bryant, I don't know if, you, if you're mm -hmm. familiar with that word Kohola. 
It's no. the Hawaiian. It's the Hawaiian word for for whale. Oh, I should know that. <laughs> no, but <laughs> but uh, yeah. So that's so we wrote a song about the humpbacks, and that that became like the the last song that we play in the film. So I think it was a positive experience. Is this something that you would do again? Would you choose to make another film if the right idea strikes you? <laughs> well, yeah. Definitely, if I can find the, the caliber of people that I've worked with this time and from the, from the get-go, because as I said, that took me at least two years or three maybe even to find some people. So if I could start out with that, I think it would be a lot easier. And, and um, yeah, but definitely include these men again if I could. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Joni, I might say something that Ellen might be too modest to say, but I've worked on a lot of films over the years as sort of in front of the camera kind of guy. And, we're, and every filmmaker is different. And, but um, I think Ellen's background as a jazz musician was quite relevant to this in the yeah. sense that she was quite adaptive. Like she'd say, I'm going this way, but you know, I don't right. have to go that way. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Right. To this and and, and right, right to the end, you were taking on new material when you, somebody came to you, like I suggested something additional and you're like, Hey, that fits. I'm going to put that in, and yeah, she yeah. did a did a riff like that. And it, I well, think her musical background really affected the 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 way she was going about the film, which was, I've worked with one other musician filmmaker who was a little bit similar, but I think Ellen's jazz orientation was just so so made her so adaptive that it, that mm -hmm. it was it was a gift to the process in the sense, and she was she was very um, as somebody who's always promoting ideas and talking to people, which is what I do. Um, Ellen was just kind of always very fluid and adaptive and just do whatever. Okay, sure. We'll think mm -hmm. about that. I think I'll take a break. You know, it was, it was very <laughs> different. It, it, was, it, was, it was fun to work with her on it. Gosh, she, Harvey, she, I, I didn't think about it like that. But yeah, that's what, of course, improvisation is a big part of being a, a musician. So, right. Yeah. You, Thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> yeah, you ripped off the materials. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That is, is great. And it's just, as I said, it's a beautiful film and the music and, and the visuals just fit together so well. So well done there too. Um, well, thank you all for, for joining us and doing this with us today. It's so, it adds such an element to seeing the film that just makes it so special. So mm. thanks for your thoughts and actions and sharing them all here in this beautifully thoughtful film and thank you thank all. you thank you I see just before thanks so much Joni for for everything and and being here with us today and and oh. Harvey and Brian thank you so much thank for you. everything you've done yeah. Joni it's delightful to see you again behind a camera <laughs> we used to live in the same town and now we're doing this virtual thing with someone in the Netherlands and people in California and it's <laughs> what a world and I do hope that we get to see each other in person soon. It's been okay. uh, over a year now. It's crazy. Yeah. Wow. But also thank you all to everybody out there in uh, mm -hmm. cyberspace for joining us and to all our sponsors and donors. I am so very grateful to all of you for helping us keep Docklands alive through this very challenging year. And please do take in all of the films and events on offer until May 16th. We owe so much to documentary filmmakers. They add so much to our worlds. I know pretty much everything I know I've learned through documentaries. So thanks and see you at the movies. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Joni. Thanks. Thank you, Ellen. Brian, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Harvey.